you're on the fast track, a good company, good job, great promotions. You're getting everywhere you want to be and you are on your way, but you want something else. You want something for yourself. You want to build your own path. You want to take care of people the way you want to take care of people. Getting out on your own requires guts and grit. Jennifer Wilson shares her story next. This is a dash of grit. Recipes for success from courageous leaders who overcome challenges and build great things. Now, podcasting from Spire to leaders in local communities like yours, here is Brian Leflock. And let's get cooking. Have you ever wanted to do something just for you? I know you're out there. You've you've uh, been in the corporate world. You're doing great things. You've got the career all set up. You've got your feet on the desk and money's coming in. But there's something else. Folks, everybody feels that at times. They want to do something else. And I'm so excited to uh, have you uh, meet our guest today. She is the owner of Windley Works, a marketing and executive coaching agency in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and executive director of Anxiety Global, an educational platform to help people reduce anxiety. She started all this from all of that. And you are really going to relate with our guest, Jennifer Wilson. Jennifer, thank you very much for being a guest on A Dash of Grit. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you because I know that I, I was there. I know so many people I talk to, they're in great spots and they're doing great things. They want something else, maybe even something for themselves or to do something else. And so you're going to be able to talk into that. So yeah, definitely. looking forward to that. So can you tell me a little bit about yourself? We like to talk about Dash of Grit being on the way to success, but what does success mean? What are you excited about? What is, uh, what's great for you right now? And what are you most proud of? Oh, I think one of the things that is exciting right now is when I think about where we are in this COVID world and the fact that there is so much uncertainty. Um, I, I coach with a lot of people. I even coach kids a little bit. And, and one of uh, my clients last week, she's eight and she's been really resilient. And you can tell that the, the COVID is starting to wear on her and not being with her friends as much and all of that. And that was one of those moments where I can't tell her the time frame. Like I know it's going to be okay, but I I really can't tell her the time frame. And and that was kind of a little bit of a oof for me. What I find exciting, however, is that there is always opportunity in crisis. There is always opportunity in crisis. And what will come of this is people are going to find new ways of doing things, new ways of working. We we don't even know yet. And trying to stay focused on that keeps me, keeps me going and, and really gets me excited about not only my own success, but all my clients' success. I think it's huge. What types of clients do you work with typically? Who do you normally work with and serve and how do you show success for them? Yeah. On the marketing side of things, as if I'm a good marketer, I would be talking about that really specific avatar. And, and I do that terribly myself. I don't necessarily <laughs> practice what I preach. Um, but I tend to work with mostly women. The kids started because uh, parents wanted me to work with their kids. And and that led to a lot of focus on anxiety, which I know we're going to talk about later. But um, so I will work with just about anybody, but it, it really started with small entrepreneurs, which is why the marketing piece got added. My husband uh, does web design, loves it, retired early and started doing that with Winley Works. His dad has been selling promotional products for over 45 years. And so we kind of rolled him in and my husband's learning that. So it really started with small entrepreneurs and then led to, um, you know, executives, of course, people in my former industry, which was the food industry and commodities. And then anybody who is working on, I want to live a bigger dream. So the life yeah. coaching grew in a way I didn't anticipate initially. Perfect. So let's, let's get into that. That sounds like that's the part that's got you really jazzed up and excited about life is, is helping people. You came from a corporate world in the food mm -hmm. industry, and now you're doing something else. Can you talk to me about the hurdles, challenges? This is a show about grit. Where did yours show up and, and tell us your story a little bit. Yeah. And it's funny. I just thought about this when you said that my first, my very first, first two women clients, both were high end executives. And I'm like, Ooh, cool. I'm doing it. And they both had a secret dream to do something else. Ah. And one, one was a be, to be a coach. So it was just too great. Like I was like, Oh, well, of course, like that's, that's how I got here. So of course that's the case. Um, I remember I was working at Barry Calibo, which is a, it, it's the world's largest chocolate company. It was mm. hands down the coolest job I had that wasn't my own company. It was, it was chocolate. Yeah. It was a huge European company that was probably about, 
seven-ish years getting established in um, the Americas, so North and South America. So we had all this money of a big, huge company, but we had a small team that was growing fast. And it was like one of those moments where you knew you would never be in this position again. Like we would, it would never be this cool again. Like, and I've heard, I've heard they've gotten so big in, um, in the Americas, but anyway, I could see a way and a path really clear to the CEO office. If not the CEO, definitely senior vice president with a lot of power. Mm -hmm. I knew exactly how I could do that. I had the FaceTime with the CEO. If I wanted to put my head down and work that hard, I could get pretty darn close if I wanted to. You were on the fast track to something big. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. The whole team um, was, it was just, it was a powerful place. And and people that were part of that original team have done very well with that organization or others who who have stayed in corporate. And many of us actually left, which is just interesting too. Just a dynamic group of people. Yeah. So at that point, that was 2009. And I said, okay, I, I, that's all, that's all I needed. All I needed to, was to know I could do it. Now, not that I don't love this company, but I want to go do that for myself. Mm. I don't know what that looks like, but if I'm going to work this hard, I want it to be solely for myself, doing something that makes me feel, tr- trust me, chocolate makes you feel good. Like there, yeah, there's, there's, there's a win to that, but it's still a business and you still do things that you're like, Ooh, I don't know if that pushed my ethics or not. You're still doing it for someone else. And you got yeah. bit by the entrepreneur bug and you want to do it for yourself. That's right. That's right. And and I grew up in a farming community. My my father has a, an impressive farming corporation with his brothers and you know, it's in my blood and um but I didn't know that yet. I mean, I really thought, "Hey, I'm a I'm a CEO kind of girl." And no, it just um it all came together and from there I started making baby steps and, and more more mindset than anything towards, "Okay, this is temporary. Um I'm going to I'm going to do something bigger for myself." Okay. And so what, what kind of things were going through your mind? Because I've been there too. And our listeners are there too. They're like, yeah, I want to, but no way I've got a house. I've got a mortgage. I've got kids. I've got college. I I can't do it. What was going through your mind there? Well, one, one blessing I had was that I was single. Mm. I wasn't, I wasn't in a, I wasn't in a relationship at all, or at least not one that I thought was going anywhere at that point. (laughs) So, and I was, I was very aware of that too. So where, you know, where can I move here now? And, and that kind of thing. So I remember, um, okay, I'm going to get this step hit off. So, you know, I made a plan and I had written this. This is actually really, really good trick for anything you're doing. Um, I wrote on a piece of paper um, the amount of debt I had. And then each month I would cross it off. It was like a post-it on my computer. And I would watch that number go down and down and down. Mm-hmm. And as I committed to that, all of a sudden this bonus would come through. Mm-hmm. Or like there was like different windfalls that were happening. And, and so that was a number one. And I did that faster than I would have ever thought I could have done that, brought that, brought that debt down really quickly. That yep. was huge. Yep. Then I did meet someone okay. who wasn't in Chicago. He was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I thought, well, that's probably not going anywhere. And, and then it kind of seemed to. And a, and a girlfriend that I worked with at Cal, Barry Calvo said, hey, have you looked at Kellogg's? Because they would hire you in a heartbeat. I forgot they were in Michigan, to be quite honest. Ah. And so I went, um, you know, talked to him about it. Let's see if I can get an interview. Let's see if I can get the job before I make the move for the guy. And everybody felt better. I'm confused though. I thought you wanted to do something for yourself. Now you're talking about going to Kellogg. I did. Yeah. So stay with me here. Okay. All right. Then I got, I went downstairs. Uh, We had a coffee shop in this building in Chicago that I worked at. Went downstairs and there was a, um, they had a little cereal cup of Kellogg cereal. So I bought it and I kept it on my desk and I would just tap on that top of it. Like, and it was cocoa. So like no one, you know, I didn't want anyone to know what I was up to. So cocoa. Um, and I got the job. I got the job faster than fast. Okay. And then they paid to move me and in an econ- it was still, we're still all recovering from the economic crisis. Um, bought my house, paid to move me. It was too good to be true. Wow. So I take my little cereal cup and I go to Kellogg's and I put it on my desk and I say, I'm going to stay here for five years. That's my new plan. I've got a new yep. plan. I'm going to stay here for five years. And then I really love the company. So maybe I'll stay here for 10 years. And this yeah, is what uh-oh. we do. We start to talk ourselves out yes, of it. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. 
So maybe I'll stay here for 10 years. Maybe I'll, and, and I had my, my I, I did that cereal cup set right there. Um, mm. And then it started to get really hard. And here was the interesting part. It got harder. I kept getting promoted. Yep. I got promoted twice in the first year, I think. And then I end up with this global job. I, I, and the whole idea was, okay, I'm moving to Michigan. I've got the guy. I get to, I, I was supposed to be doing a different commodity than I'd ever done before. And then they changed that up right before I started. And so I was back to doing what I always did and then getting promoted on top of it. And, and you see where everybody gets in these cycles, right? And all of a sudden it got not only difficult, but boring. Yes. And I was asked to take over operations outside of the States and the people in those countries didn't want me to take over. So they liked me and that was all good, but they made things very difficult for me. Mm. And it just kept getting harder and harder. So it's interesting that the doors were opened for you all along to stay on that track, but it sounds like they're starting to close. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really important that you can recognize that and make a good decision, isn't it? Yeah. And it was, um, with each promotion came a pay increase. So that, of course. that gets harder and harder. Um, mm -hmm. It was a level where you felt a lot of respect and a lot of prestige, and that's a little bit difficult to give up. And then you look back about, I mean, at that point, I'm, you know, I'm getting well over 15 years of building that specific career. Hard to walk away from. Yeah. So um, to make that leap was pretty giant. And I'll tell you what, that cereal cup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was still working for me. So I said, okay, let me just set a date. And I had the support of, of my now husband who he's like, if you want to do it, do it now. Don't wait. Don't forget about this 10 year thing. Forget about the fight. If you're going to do it, just do it. We'll figure it out. So that was helpful. And he said, I, I'd like it if you at least had a part-time job while you were working on this other thing. Okay. So I, I tap on this, um, on my cereal and I set a date for myself. So it was April. I set a date end of April. I set a date for December 13th. There was a reason I can't remember now, but December 13th of that year, if I did not if something didn't fall into place, I was going to leave in December, no matter what. That was just on your own. Just leave. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That was so a promise you made what, to yourself. Yep. Okay. So, so guess what happens within what? a month, probably less. Um, I'm telling my girlfriend, she was my golf partner. I'm telling her about my plan and she says, you're kidding. I got a job for you. She's like, it's 32 hours a week, but for you, that would probably feel like part-time, which it did. Yeah. Uh, and but it's actually still a full-time position. So you'd get, you'd get benefits, which was a perfect transition for me. Cause I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to go from 60 hours a week to 20. That would have really did me in. And I was like, are you serious? Like I kept lining up and then everything just falls into place. And I've got that job lined up by, by before the end of the summer. And I was, it, it, it was a little bit of a process, but it, for sure by, I think I left or first of September, right? I, I worked the week after Labor Day at Kellogg. I gave them a couple months to like prepare for my leave. That was awesome too, that I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. And there I was, I was in a new position, able to start coach school and, and start working on my plan. And you just started your plan. And so I'm going to push back here real quick because mm -hmm. that Jennifer's sounds awful easy. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right. You, just, you showed up and you did your thing and you got all the jobs and it was all easy and good. So let's talk real here. What was, yeah. what was, what was going on? What caused you to maybe second guess your decisions? I mean, you left a really high power, high track thing yeah. and went into executive coaching with yourself in a, in a part-time position that was not easy. Talk so, to me about the fears. So first of all, and this is, um, I don't, I don't regret this at all, but so new job, 32 hours a week. Yep. So same thing. I'm going to give myself two months to learn this job. Two months really became more six to eight months. Yes. Um, and 32 hours a week. And, and it was a position where I was managing some staff. So you have to acclimate to personalities. You have to gain respect. I mean, that's not easy to walk in and manage people. Okay. And next thing you know, I'm, so that is end of 2014. All of a sudden I'm getting to the end of 2015 and I haven't actually signed up to do any of the coach school yet. Oh, and then things are getting interesting and difficult and political. And it was the kind of job that kind of invites that. And I was um, like, okay, 
okay, now the good news was I had done this already. I'd already taken that big, huge leap. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't about to fail at the bigger thing. I knew better than to get comfortable. Yes. And, but I did, I had to really pick myself up, write the check for the school, which then started in January of 2016. And then I'm so grateful for this. Now this was specific to my experience, but the coach school said, start coaching, start charging people for money. Now I didn't do that. I wasn't brave enough to do that, but they actually wanted you to have a business going so that they could be teaching you through your own individual business, which I think is really great but scary. So I didn't actually do that. But the fact that they were pushing that kept me at a higher level than just getting the education and not actually starting the business. So how how long then did that take to start getting a little bit of traction for you? Was it a while? Yeah, it was definitely, um, that was in January. I had to coach in front of the class, Mm. Uh, you know, and this is all teleclass and online, but I had to coach in front of the class for the first time. I want to say, and that spring, like March or April. And it was terrifying um, because one of the first things I found out and I'd had coaches, but I really believed that I was going to be giving advice, even though I had been the client. And the first thing they tell you is you are not a mentor. Now, you can be a mentor too. And a lot of people dropped out of the first classes because they just wanted to go mentor people. But ah. that was hard too, because I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know if I actually know how to do this. Can I do this? I'm what do you need to do? What, if you're not mentoring, what are you doing? Asking you're and hold, listening? You're holding space. You're asking questions. You're listening. You're you're really now, my coaching is a little different. I do, I, I do inject sometimes. I don't leave people hanging, nor did some of my best coaches. They never left me hanging. But really, when someone is figuring it out, if they figure it out themselves, if they find their own insight, their change is more likely to happen Mm. versus me as a coach giving them their insight. I'm interested in your approach towards that because it's it's trying to get started, trying to get going, but you realize that everyone else is doing it that way. I'm going to do it this way. Is that, that sounds like some advice for an entrepreneur to to get out there. That is probably really good. Yeah. This has always been my motto as an entrepreneur, as a employee. I learned this in high school already go in and learn the rules, learn them the exact right way and know them Mm -hmm. because then you know how to break them in Mm -hmm. a way that actually works. Wow. And I can't, I cannot give that advice enough for, I don't, even if you're working at McDonald's, know the rules exactly the way they're written, especially at a place like McDonald's who has, you know, long and tried true results, right? Because then you can see why if you've learned them. Don't just go in and think, you know, better or that, Hey, I know this is what's going to work. This is why this is important. Now, do I want to break it? And if I do, how can I still honor it? Because there was a reason it was there in the first place. I believe in that wholeheartedly. So you go in, you learn the game and then you improve on the game Mm -hmm. in a way that makes you different. I'm wondering as you were doing that and working on that, and I know it's a, it's a hard path. Did you ever get called back? to the corporate world? Did you ever have second thoughts? Like mm-hmm. maybe I should go back and put my feet back up on the desk a little bit and get on that fast track. Yeah, I was, well, one thing that I did, it's, this is actually a great story. This just happened. Um, so I celebrated five years since establishing Winley works mm-hmm. in October. And this just happened to me. I was consulting a little bit in my old industry. And, and when I, did get a consultant gig, it paid very well. And so that was kind of nice. And at one point I thought that they were just going to come in. So, oh, I'll have that. Well, they didn't come in fast and furiously, but I had a few here and there. And then they kind of dried up. And it was funny. I got an offer to do one that was, that was lucrative. And I, I passed it up and it felt so good because it's like, I don't need that. And and, and this will just distract me. So yeah, I still kept, I kept a foot firmly in my old industry. And I feel like it's now out. And, and that has to do with the fact that I'm finally to a point where I actually feel as confident being a coach and a business owner as I did being a commodities expert. And that took the full five years to be quite honest. And, and that is probably one of the things, if you're doing a major change, I wasn't prepared for that. I mean, I thought I was, but I was not prepared to, you know, and I, I can fake it till I make it 
with the best of them. But, you know, when you go to those network events and you're staying coach after over 15 years of, you know, being somebody that, you know, after the first five years in that industry, I didn't have to introduce myself anymore. And then especially when I became on the, you know, a buyer for these major organizations, people were chasing me down. I didn't make cold calls anymore. So to go back to that and now feel like I'm only selling myself. Like, I, you know, before I, with the, the irony of that is when I was a young 20 something year old making a name in commodities, I was out there selling myself like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Hey, look at me. I'm young. I'm cute. I'm, you know, I can, I can talk real fast. I can be one of the boys because of course it was heavily male dominated industry. So I can be one of the boys. And now all of a sudden I have to sell my knowledge, my skill as a coach, um, why I think this is important how I can inspire you. It's, it's all on me now. That was tough. And now you're doing something else. Now you're, you're that entrepreneur bug hits you again. And it sounds like it's from some kind of a passion inside. Can you talk to me a little bit about uh, anxiety global and, and, and what's, what's your next hurdle that you're going to be overcoming? So anxiety global is a, we, we're calling it an education platform. My partner is Beth Tuttle. And Beth does a, it's a technique called emotional freedom technique or EFT tapping. And it's been around, um, organized professionally since the eighties. And it's, you actually use your fingers to tap on the acupuncture points in Chinese medicine. And there's, there's a lot to it and it's a really great technique. And so I would find myself referring coaching clients to her that seem to have anxiety or we're trying to break a habit or something like that. Well, then she started referring clients to me that needed more of that coaching style, the reframing. And what we found is the clients that we were referring back and forth the most at that time, this was about a year ago, were college age kids. So we're like, there's an epidemic here. There's something going on with this anxiety and this age group. And, um, and it was funny. I, I have a teacher friend who a couple of years ago, she said, if I have one more 16 year old girl use the word anxiety, I'm going to scream. Mm. We, we all believed it was a trend. We didn't see that there was really something forming here. And, um, well, really what the truth is, is it's not new. They just have the language for it. This, this next generation has the language to speak about it in a way where we might've just overrode it. Oh, right. anxiety. We'll just barrel through it. That, that isn't always helpful either. So, um, anyway, we, we launched our initiative, which was at first anxiety, Michigan at Western Michigan university last fall. And we kind of got wishy-washed results and we were open to that. And um, we found that the moms that were making the calls for us were more interested, more in need and more willing to work through and, and really begin to manage their anxiety, their anxiety. And when mom's managing her anxiety, the whole family is managing yeah. their stress. Boy, that's anxiety. for sure. Yep. So uh, anyway, we've launched from there and we had all kinds of wonderful things planned for 2020, speaking engagements. We found ourselves in corporate environments. We had conferences set up. Um, Everybody is looking for a bridge and a way to manage anxiety quickly in businesses, churches, on and on. And then all of that was canceled. (laughs) And so now it's finding, you know, we took a pause and now it's finding a renewal in what that looks like now. So now conferences are online. We just did a series for a church. uh, So we changed our name because we outgrew Michigan the second we launched. Yes. So Anxiety Global, we we just did a series uh, for a church in Brooklyn, Queens, New York. And, uh, and taught our techniques and what we think works. And it was great. And, and we're just, we've got, we've got a lot of ideas and we know that there's a need here. And, you know, I, I, you've done it once before you're going to do it again. I can see your passion. I can see your excitement. And, and, uh, and, and I'm wondering, you know, what would you share and we can wrap it up. Someone who's thinking about this and wants to be like you because they want to be smiling and excited and making a difference in people's lives. Um, you mentioned, we were talking a little bit about the times currently that might just line up perfectly for that. I mean, you, you are a, a proof that if you just do it, step out there, um, call you out of the boat into the water, get out there and do it, that you can make it happen. And you just have that faith. Um, what would you share with folks who are wondering about that? The most important thing about kind of where we are right now, if you are an entrepreneur, you're right, you've done it. So you have faith. If you've you've been able to create a paycheck out of thin air, 
then you, you at least have a model down. And so what's really important is that people that have only worked in corporate, I'll be honest, I'm a little worried that if the economy goes sideways, and we don't know yet, Mm -hmm. but if it happens to go sideways, some of those people will be really insecure um, about where they're going next. So any entrepreneurs already know to be looking for the opportunities in the crisis. So if you're someone who is in corporate or even just in between things and you're like, I don't even know what I want to do. I don't even know if I want to go back to work for someone if you're in a layoff. If you have the means, um, especially if you're still working, work with a coach and pursue that, you know, start to look at, okay, how would this look if I did it? And start working on your mindset because it's mindset first. Everything is about, I can, I believe this can happen. Um, do that first to really start building a mindset around that. Take in, listen to podcasts like this, learn what people are doing, start getting up early. Gosh, I cannot, I, before when I was working that 32 hour a week job, I would get up at four o'clock every morning and I would do something for Winley Works. I, even if it was something tiny and small. And in the early days, like mm-hmm. even setting up a Twitter account, I'm like, okay, today I'll set up Twitter, tomorrow I'll set up Instagram. Well, something went wrong. So it was three days to set up Twitter. Of course. And I, yeah. And and you have to be prepared for that. And um, so just get started. Yeah. And, and and that is so just just to take that leap. And, and uh, you know, every time I've seen it happen, I mean, there you're gonna be okay. And and you know, if you take the wrong leap, that's okay too. It's okay to take the wrong step. You're gonna be okay. There's not quicksand on the other side. And so thank you for for sharing your story and and uh and your your just drive and passion for doing great things. I really appreciate the the time and thank you for being a guest on Dash of Grit. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh Jennifer, if someone wanted to reach out to you, and I know they want to, uh, because I know they're going through the same things, how would they do that? So um, you can get me on email, which is Jennifer at Winleyworks, W-I-N-D-L-E-Y-W-O-R-K-S.com, mm-hmm. winleyworks.com, and then anxietyglobal.com is where you can find Beth and I. Perfect. And so much luck to you. I, I know you're going to do great things. I've seen it happen in so many other entrepreneurs before, and it's happening for you too. So congratulations. Thank you. A quick uh, uh, note from our sponsor and presenter at Spire Advertising. Spire is a marketing company, and we want to be an integral part of your team. Uh, We're responsible for the good and accountable for the bad. And I think that's what sets us apart. So um, you'll find us at spiread.com, or you can reach me direct at brian at spiread.com or on LinkedIn. I am Brian Leffelock, Director of Sales with Spire Advertising. Thank you again to Jennifer Wilson of Windley Works and Anxiety Global. Now get out there, show some grit, and win the day. This is a Dash of Grit. Recipes for success from courageous leaders who overcome challenges and build great things. 